Okay, good evening, everyone, and welcome. I am Lauren Gates, along with my co-host this evening, my special co-host, Dr. Ben Moralia, of our Airway Health Solutions Conversation Series, and our special guest tonight, Dr. Gerald Simmons. So welcome, gentlemen. I'm so excited to have you both on. This is going to be a really fantastic hour with so many tidbits for us to learn from. But um, our topic tonight is is screening, monitoring, and management of OSA from the dental chair. And Dr. Simmons, you're gonna review the role of the dental professional in recognizing red flags in children and screening patients for OSA and monitoring treatment progress in patients of all ages. And somehow we're gonna miraculously do this in 25 minutes. <laughs> I'll do my best. <laughs> So um, welcome. I was going to say it's really exciting to have both of you on tonight because there's so many questions that I receive that are applicable to both. And it's going to be a nice, robust um, Q&A session as well. Uh, Dr. Morali and I, we were just at the Greater New York Dental Meeting um, presenting at the Airway Summit. And I, I don't think there was one presenter that didn't mention your name at some point. <laughs> so somehow, I don't know if your ears were ringing on Saturday, but it's amazing how you really have entrenched all your knowledge and really have helped us in the dental world understand, um, understand your point of view from the medical world. So welcome, and we're thrilled to have you. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Yeah, great to see you again. Thanks for coming. Great. OK. So I guess I, you want me to just uh, get started here? Yeah, why don't we get started? Because then we'll have enough time to do the, um, all the questions and have a nice discussion. And, all right, uh, great. So here, let me yeah, share my on. screen. All right. You got the screen okay there? Yep, looks All good. Right. And then I've got my little laser pointer. How's that? Wow, you're okay. fancy. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> All yeah. right, all in the comforts of my home. Yes. So, um, all right, great. Well, um, so my talk this evening, is basically the topic is the role of the dentist uh, in recognizing red flags in children and screening patients for sleep apnea and monitoring treatment progress in, in all your patients. It's a pretty big topic and uh, we'll leave it open to a lot of questions later. But I um, want to just start off by just letting you all know that there's an upcoming conference that it, um, that it will be in February, February 3rd through 5th. It's going to be actually the um, the, over the last 18 years I've done this conference, this has been the 16th time. Uh, it's really about collaboration with uh, physicians and dentists. This year is going to be pretty unique. Uh, it's going to be, it's in Houston, it's going to be a live conference, and there'll be a lot of discussion on combination therapy and uh, also using aligner therapy in conjunction with oral appliances for airway management. Um, also, uh, some new approaches in orthognathic surgery and um, a variety of really uh, interesting things and in remote patient monitoring, um, looking for treatment progress, which I'll just touch on a little bit tonight. So, you know, the thing that I'm a neurologist, but um, in a, and early on in my career, uh, during my training even, I realized that, you know, the jaw, the mouth is such an integral part of airway dynamics and airway is an important part when it comes to sleep and sleep continuity. So a long time ago, I realized that dentists are right there looking in the mouths of all these patients. And if they just had a little bit more of a uh, perspective of what they're looking at uh, and understanding the airway more and sleep, they would be phenomenal in terms of identifying uh, sleep pathology in patients. And they could initiate the process that would bring someone to getting the kind of uh, medical uh, uh, dental medical intervention that they needed. Well, okay, that's good for adults, but geez, if we could identify that in smaller, younger indiv individuals, then we can maybe reduce this um, uh, sleep apnea burden that we have on society and all these other medical conditions that can result from obstructive breathing during sleep. You know, and there's, you know, some of the more obvious uh, configurations or anatomical uh, uh, um, features that predispose an individual to uh, a compromised airway. And I'm sure most of the audience is familiar with uh, issues such as you know, micrognathia, retrognathia, uh, just narrow, high arch, uh, you know, palate, uh, things of that nature. But there are more subtle features. And it's not just 
bony structures, but soft tissue structures as well. So it's a combination of all the different components that make up an anatomy. When we start talking about kids, there's it's such um, minimally charted, I don't wanna say uncharted, it's minimally charted uh, territory. And there's very few uh, individuals that are really focusing in on pediatrics and pediatric uh, airway identification uh, of, of problems and, and management. Well, Steve Carsonson uh, led the path with the American Dental Association to come up with the ADA Children's Airway Initiative. And then as a result of that, we came up with uh, um, the Children's Airway Screening Task Force, the TASC, uh, the, the CAST uh, group. Um, and our CAST uh, group has worked on uh, coming up with ideas of screening and how do we screen? And we have uh, currently a, um, a working model that we're um, looking forward to validating before we really try to promote it aggressively. Um, and uh, so we're working on getting our funding for the validation study. But I wanna walk you through the concepts that we walked through to understand what do you have to think about when you're trying to screen kids for having these kind of airway problems. So the CAS uh, task force, um, we basically broke down the history into five components of signs and symptoms. And it's basically your, the five components are air pathway, breathing sounds, sleep activity, morning condition, and daytime functioning. So let's look at this in a little more detail. So what do I mean by air pathway? So it's normal to have an individual, child or adult, to be breathing through your nose. Nasal breathing is normal. Oral breathing is considered rescue breathing. So if someone is breathing through their mouth while they're asleep, that's a red flag. You want to know, is a child typically um, breathing through their mouth. You know, on, some people do it even while they're awake. They're gonna sit there while they're relaxed, uh, watching television or reading with their mouth open. That's not normal. And what about, but maybe during the, um, during the day, their mouth is closed, but what about at night? So observations that the parents can make can be very, very important. You know, and what about, if the, if the mouth isn't really fully open, but the lips are just apart. So there's enough airflow going just through the lips. So, you know, how do you put the concept in someone's mind of oral breathing? You know, if you say his mouth open, someone may fit in their mind, in their mind to have a preconfigured uh, uh, feature of what that's like with the mouth wide open, like, uh, but it may be just having it slightly open to where that becomes the pathway for respiration significant. And then is this only on rare occasions? So if you're going to ask this question, the parent may just say yes, but maybe it's only when the child's sick. So you have to really identify like when the child's not sick, you know, normally you know, is the child breathing through the mouth. So that's sort of a the air pathway kind of concept. What about breath sounds? Does the child snore? Well, any child that snores, that's not normal. You know, children should not snore, but maybe they only snore when they're sick and they're congested. Okay, does that mean that they have sleep apnea? Well, maybe on rare occasions when they're sick, but if that's only on a, a rare basis, it doesn't necessarily warrant an aggressive evaluation. Right? What about pauses in breathing during sleep? Maybe the child isn't really making much in terms of um, snoring sounds, but, they, but the breathing may not be rhythmic and there may be intermittent pauses followed by brief arousals and disruptions and moving around in sleep. So th those are red flags. So when you're talking to a parent, they may give you more of a description that my child doesn't snore, but I constantly hear them having these little pauses and then they seem startled a little bit in their sleep. Well, that is a sign of obstructive sleep apnea. Okay, and um, what's noisy breathing? Okay, you know, what constitutes snoring? At what point is it just raspy sounds versus snoring? So, you know, these are not really all well defined, but these are, so these are the kind of questions that come up. And when you start asking questions of uh, patients or parents, you know, you're gonna get a whole variety of answers. So how do you sort this stuff out? What about sleep activity or sleep behaviors? Those are important to understand. So you wanna know, is a child tossing and turning all night long? Those tossing and turning movements could be from arousals that could be precipitated by obstructive breathing. 
However, there's other th abnormalities that can trigger that, such as restless leg syndrome with periodic leg movements of sleep. You know, and it could just be uh, problems with nightmares, night terrors, causing a lot of movements during sleep. But what about kicking movements during sleep? That could be disruptive and that could be a red flag. Again, those kicking movements get tied in with the tossing and turning. What about sleepwalking? You know, it's, it's normal for a child to sleepwalk on, on an occasional basis, maybe once every six months or, or longer, you know, intervals between episodes, maybe doing it just for a couple of years. But when it starts happening more frequently, like once a month, and it's going on for, let's say, more than six months, then you have to start thinking that, you know, there may be something uh, more significant going on. And it may actually roll into other issues that the child may be having as well. Now, what about grinding and clenching teeth? You know, there, I think in the last session that we had, we talked about sleep bruxism in more detail. And I pointed out uh, uh, studies where it's been shown that the grinding clenching really opens up the airway, that there's less negative pressure in the airway uh, associated with increased muscle tone of the masseter and the other pharyngeal muscles. So we know that grinding and clenching can be associated with obstructive breathing, and it looks like in many instances, it's working as a protective mechanism. So that's something you're gonna to wanna to ask about. Now, as a dentist, you may be seeing the changes in the, in the dentition, the enamelware and things of that nature, chipping, uh, just various um, features. In, in a child, you may not be, uh, may not be long enough to have tori, but you know, other things that in adults are going to be are a sign of chronic uh, uh, bruxing. But, um, but these are things for the dentist to clearly take note of and to wonder, you know, why is this child have features on their dentition? Maybe there's an airway problem. You know, it's not just a dental problem. It's a sign of an airway problem. What about sleeping on the stomach? Body position plays a role. When a child is on their back or even an adult, Gravity plays a role and it, and it enhances the airway obstruction. So a sort of preventive maneuver that the body will learn is to roll onto the stomach. So a lot of times a child will, will be sleeping on their stomach or they're gonna sleep in a kneeling position, maybe with their head ex extended. There are some unusual postures that a child may well, take on during their sleep because they're actually able to breathe better in those postures in those positions and so that's the, why they're doing those um, and the parent may not think much of it but if it occurs on a regular basis again that's a red flag. Dr. Sims just a quick question on that is sleeping with the arms and hands extended above or over the head a red flag as well? Well if it's if a child let's say is on their back right and they're sleeping on their back and every but their arms are extended I wouldn't think that it's going to have uh, that would be red flag. The arms could be extended though with them on the line you know, prone on their belly. That would be more of uh, airway clearance. But uh, I wouldn't think that lying on their back uh, with their arms up would um, have the influence that would be necessary to open up the airway. So I'm not sure that they would adopt that kind of posture. Um, but then again, I'm, there may be a rare instance where that has been associated, but it's not something that we typically have seen. So the other um, aspect of this overall uh, 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 various features that we're looking at in children would be how is the child when they wake up in the morning? What's the condition of the child in the morning? You know, are they um, having difficult time waking up? Does the parent have to sit there and spend all this time getting the child out of bed in the morning? Are they sleeping through the alarm? Are they hard to get off to school? What about nasal congestion? So nasal congestion may develop during sleep, and that could be a ramification of obstructive breathing. So if the child goes to bed and their nose is clear, but they're waking up in the morning frequently all congested, that's another red flag. Obviously, they may be allergic to their pillow, but you know that's an easy uh, thing to uh, to demonstrate. You switch their pillow, and, um, and it probably won't go away because usually it's not the case. Or the other issue would be a dry mouth, or, or drooling on the pillow, frequent drooling, because those are signs of mouth breathing. So maybe you're, the, no one's observing the child during the night when they're mouth breathing, 
But when um, the morning comes around and the parents there, they see the child's mouth's all dry, the child may be complaining of a dry mouth, and they can see a lot of saliva on the pillow. What about chaw pain? You know, the bruxing, clenching goes on to sleep can lead to uh, jaw dysfunction, TMD. Um, and children can have complaints of jaw pain. It's not as common as we would see as someone gets older, but it does occur in children. And there's headaches, just waking up with headaches. You know, why is the child going to bed without the headache? And the headache is something that occurs on awakening. A red flag that there's something going on during sleep that is uh, triggering that symptom. Another aspect too is daytime functioning. So how is the child during the, to the day? Do they have excessive sleepiness? They're falling asleep in class or whenever they're in the car strapped in the seatbelt, driving off to some place, they fall asleep. You know, does the child seem tired during the day? A red flag. That tiredness could be due to what's occurring at night. So the parent really should be, if they are not able to provide much history, they take more notice. And then uh, to see if there, uh, if these things are, you know, there's some of the things we talked about going on during the night. Then, oh, there's also issues of hyperactivity and children having difficult times sitting still because they're trying to stay stimulated because whenever they stop being stimulated, their sleepiness kicks in. So they're demonstrating behaviors of, of hyperactivity and difficulty sitting still. Now it can be related to restless leg syndrome. It doesn't automatically mean that it's a, uh, airway problem, but you should definitely be thinking about airway as a possibility in a child that has a hard time sitting in your chair, you know, and you're having the child wait to, to be examined and they're just getting fidgety and they're just they're real disruptive. The child has difficulty concentrating. The same thing. If you don't get proper sleep, it's hard to maintain your focus during the day. And there could be behavioral and emotional problems and, and ADHD, as I pointed out, and, and poor school performance. So this sort of rounds out a whole um, number of features. And what we've done in CAST is we've come up with a way of consolidating this down into a quick five question questionnaire. And I don't want to really go into all that yet because we haven't validated it, but the concept is having a big net to capture as many, um, as many potential children that are at risk as possible in a very easily implementable fashion. So that it could be so screening can occur on a very large scale. That's our goal. Not to sit down with all the detail. We would need a quick questionnaire. Now, if something's abnormal on the screening questionnaire, then that child deserves more attention to then extract and get more detail. But the first pass has to be quick, simple, but somewhat comprehensive. Okay, so what's the overall general algorithm with the dentist? In, uh, you know, in, in dealing with you know, sleep medicine. So there's gonna be screening. And whether it's an adult or a pediatric patient, different kinds of screening, depending on uh, the, the type of patient. And it should also include certain aspects of the exam. What are, uh, what are the features of the child's error? And then really we're promoting uh, collaboration. Not that the dentist should be working independently, but the dentist should be working with a, Physician. Now that could be where you're located locally, or it could be remote. Nowadays, with telemedicine, there's the ability to to get expert uh, collaboration from uh, for, for a dentist. You know, to collaborate with a physician hundreds of miles away. Uh, and so we're seeing more telemedicine being implemented. I mean, I, I'll see patients. I'm in Texas, and I see patients all over the country um, through this uh, platform. And then uh, there'll be an evaluation and there may need to be a, a study, a sleep study. And the study may be a home study um, or it might be an in-lab study. They're not the same. A normal home study in someone that has symptoms really deserves a more thorough in-lab study. And not all in-lab studies have been done the same way. And we don't really have time to go into the, the various aspects of what makes one study different than another. but there are differences in how the data is collected and also how it's scored. Um, but um, you could do home testing, but a normal home test should not be used to rule out uh, airway problem in someone that is symptomatic.
And so that's sort of in a nutshell. But whatever the results of the study are, they should be then uh, communicated back to the dentist and then there's a collaborative uh, treatment plan. And then the dentist can do a variety of things. So, um, you know, I think Kevin Boyd's on your faculty. He's talking, talks about you know, early intervention in, in children through orthodontic uh, uh, maneuvers to open up the skeletal structure in a child that's very young because the bony structures are more malleable at that point. And it's easier to make an intervention at that point if you can identify those children that are uh, at risk of, of having a uh, compromised airway. And then once you start treating, then you want to have information of how is that patient doing. So just real briefly, I just can tell you, we've implemented a program now where we're actually monitoring patients every single night. Not all of our patients, but a lot of patients. And this is a three-month uh, just a snippet where I'm getting basically an apnea apopnea uh, index on by a wearable technology um, on a nightly basis. And this patient's moving along to finally we got the right and we could see how um, uh, zero would be up here as on up. So higher is better. And here we're looking at time where the oxygen is less than 90%. And here's an apnea apopnea index or a, a, an equivalent to apnea apopnea index. This isn't this using wearable technology. It's not as reliable as an in-lab study, but clearly very useful information. We can finally see, yep, we got our treatment right. Look how well this patient's doing. So what is, this, what is, this, what is the system that you're- Well, this is being implemented, uh, you know, th this particular, uh, to do this nightly, there's not, you can't just go out and get this. But we're utilizing cardiopulmonary coupling here, and um, and I can go into that more in another discussion. But but we're able to do this now on a nightly basis, and um, uh, you know, through collaborations that we have and things that we're um, you know that we've developed. Um, but so we can. But we're doing this also to assist dental patients. So if someone is going to be let's say having appliance therapy. Uh, uh, for treating their apnea, we can get the information of how the appliance is working and get that back to the dentist and let them know whether the patient needs further advancements and things of that nature. So this deserves a talk in and of, it, uh, in and of itself for another time, although we are going to cover it at this conference. So, um, and you know, the faculty of the conference, Kevin Boyd's on there, Ron Perrine, he's actually um, been the president of the uh, AADSM's, uh, the Dental Sleep Board exam. He's all these he's stepping down now. He's been the president for a number of years. Um, Ron and I have worked collaboratively for years. Um, he's an oral facial pain uh, specialist that now took when he met me, I uh, uh, convinced him. It didn't, wasn't hard to convince him. He saw the logic right away, but uh, to get into dental sleep medicine, this was back in like 2002 when he started getting involved and he's done a great job. We've collaborated for years. He's on the faculty, Rob V's um, he's been in the field for years with Space Maintainers Laboratory. Uh, uh, Yosef Yosefian. Joseph is an orthodontist in Seattle. He does phenomenal work uh, and has some really unique ideas. And then Delphi is an uh, oral maxillar facial surgeon in Houston that doing uh, 3D printing of plates uh, to really enhance the uh, uh, surgical interventions that can be done. And you know, and we're going to be talking about combination therapy. Uh, they're going to learn about Inspire, which is hypoglossal nerve stimulators. Um, clearly, the, uh, insomnia, narcolepsy, restless leg syndrome. I mean, this con this the reason why we include these in a course with dentists is because a dentist should have some awareness of these other conditions. Not that they're going to treat it, but once you open up Pandora's box and start asking me about sleep all sorts of things come out of your patient's mouths. They'll tell you a lot of different things and how do you then incorporate that into your overall working uh, knowledge of, of how you're gonna approach this patient. And so this course is meant to really give you a lot more information um, about, so there's gonna be a lot of myofunctional therapy, is gonna, she's on the faculty, and there's some other really new cutting edge stuff that uh, uh, will be in here with connected tissue disorders and uh, uh, autonomic dysfunction. Um, and stuff. So anyhow, um, this is February 3rd through 5th, and uh, dentalsleepconference.com is the, the webpage. Um, I think we, we've, we had an early bird special that was supposed to end uh, yesterday, but I think we're going to let it stay there just for a little bit longer. So 
sign up. If, you, if you're interested in going, sign up now because you'll still be able to take advantage of the, uh, I think there's a $400 discount on there right now. I put the um, link in the chat for everybody. Oh, great. Thank you. Okay. And uh, so that's basically it. Um, you know, my practice conference is Sleep Medicine Associates. Um, we've been at this for you know years. I've been at this. I used to be on faculty at UCLA back in the 90s. Uh, but um, our webpage, csma.clinic, and um, that really wraps up the, sort of the slides that I have to touch on this real well, broad topic. That's great, because we, we have a lot of questions, actually, for also for Dr. Moralia as well. But Dr. Boyd actually asked, how young can you utilize a CPC device to assess sleep quality? Dr. Boyd asked that? Yes, he did. <laughs> Well, we're, we're, we want to find out the answer to that question. It actually, um, you know, there are, it, clearly it may be abnormal in a, in a two-year-old. So it becomes, uh, so the thing is, what's the actual sensitivity? So how many false negatives will you get? And when you compare it to in-lab polysomnography. So, and, and I don't think we would want to rely on a, a tool like this to exclude the diagnosis, but we would definitely want to see if we could use it to include the diagnosis. But, um, you know, there is FDA approval for using this in pediatrics. Um, and it's just, it becomes a little less, uh, clear as the child gets younger as to uh, the efficacy. So at a convenience, you could always do the test. It comes back positive. That's great. Um, if it's negative, you don't want to stop there if you have clinical concern. Uh, Dr. Morali, did you have any specific questions for Dr. Simmons that you wanted to jump in or I'll, I'll just keep going with these from here? Oh yeah, I've never attended that conference, but it looks like a winner. I can see from the few names that are posted already. So I, I was just looking at my calendar, see what I'm doing <laughs> February 3rd, 4th, and 5th. Looks I'll like be I'm there free. too, I'm sure. <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> I'll see you there. <laughs> Great. Well, you know, um, Houston you know, isn't necessarily the most um, touristy area, but that's okay. That'd be the, that means there's less diversions from the conference. When people come, you know, they can say focus. We're if it's in like Las Vegas or, you know, or in Marina del Rey, or <laughs> there's mm -hmm. people sometimes want to wander off and say, well, I I'm going to go you know, do something else other than learn. <laughs> but if you come to, yeah, I think one point of clarity was the the wearable the wearable sleep testing you mentioned. That's at your clinic though. It's still in your clinic overnight. Yeah, no, that's not overnight. The wearable stuff is we're doing that at home and, and we're not using it for diagnosis. I'm using it for monitoring once I have a diagnosis. So that way I can assist okay. the treatment management. So I can, I can see how the treatments that I'm implementing are helping my patients. And I also am doing that for other clinicians. So, so, and this is something we've only very recently been implementing, but the idea is if someone's going to be, um, let's say doing uh, some type of oral appliance therapy, we can give ongoing input of the improvements that are being made. If someone is undergoing, let's say hypoglossal nerve stimulation therapy, we can give input as to well, working whether we have to change the parameters of the stimulator. Um, if it's PAP, if it's CPAP, IPAP, or whatever, we can see, you know, I mean, those, the machine will give you information, but the information we get is more reliable you're going to get from just the machine itself. We've seen that in many instances. Um, hmm. Sometimes the machine will say that the person's doing worse than they're actually doing because it's using flow, which may be disrupted, and the machine may think they're having more events. And the opposite's also true. Um, where patients have been having worse breathing than what the machine is able to identify. Hmm. Okay. There are a couple of questions about the sleep image ring. What are your thoughts on doing with that with the sleep image ring? Well, what do you, I'm not sure what's the question. I mean, so we're doing, yeah. so, so we're doing, okay. if you go to sleep image, you'll be able to get a single night test. But, you know, I mean, working with what I'm doing, it's going to be ongoing ma management. It's, it, it does, it's a build in a different way. It's not a single night sleep study. 
And how can people work with you? What is the best way? Reach out. Contact me. <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, they have my, um, you know, my webpage uh, through this, you know, email me out here, put up my email address. Yeah, um, I just actually um, sent a document that you gave from last time because there's a lot of questions on the on the um, relationship between um, bruxism and airway disorder. So I just have that article there. But let me go ahead and put your your website in. And also, you can put my email address. Great. Uh, sometimes I, I might be slow to get to. There's a lot going on, but. Um, but you know, clearly, um, we have patients that are being referred to us from all over the country. So, um, you know, it's it's a challenge to uh, to be able to you know um, be everywhere all the time. That's why we have teledentistry, thank goodness, right? In telehealth, what is the role of maxillary expansion, myofunctional appliances, in OSA sleep disorder breathing in children? Well, you know, you take this? <laughs> should I throw my two cents in there? Yeah, please do. So the, those are those are all good ingredients that can help with you know the development of the child's face, and so you know anything that helps a child develop wider and forwards is a good pathway, and anything that helps correct soft tissue dysfunction is a good pathway. So when you're thinking about expansion appliances, growth and development appliances, guidance appliances, myofunctional therapy, frenum revision even as little as nasal hygiene can make a difference. So uh, those are all things on a checklist that can you know, be used to help a child regain the growth and development their jaws should have had, and then also correct the soft tissue dysfunction so that you can continue the path of growth and development that they should have. Ultimately, the goal is to have you know, uh, every single child erupt their wisdom teeth into function. And that's what we used to see way back when. You know, Normal growth and development is 32 teeth landing beautifully in a fully set of, a fully developed set of jaws. So, you know, any technique that you have that you can put together that helps take the child from underdeveloped to fully developed is going to be well received, let's say. You want to add to that, Dr. Simmons, or? No, well, I agree. I mean, right. there's, there clearly, um, uh, you yeah. know, there, even with healthy start or myobrace, you know, these uh, various um, uh, appliances that children can bite into. We, well, you know, so we know that a lot of uh, dysfunction of the airway has evolved. Uh, this is something we've learned from Kevin uh, through the changes in our diet. So even just eating becomes a, uh, a influencing factor on our airway. So if the foods are soft, you're not working as hard if the food, as if the foods are rougher, tougher, and require more you know, work. Um, so these appliances are really putting stresses and strains in, uh, in various uh, um, vectors to try to compensate for the deficiencies that have evolved because of, you know, over time. So, um, so I think they they all have a these they all play a role. Great. What percent of oral parafunctional habits are due to airway disorders? Is there research to this matter? There may be, but so are you talking about like um, even like tick kind of behaviors? Um, there's you know clearly uh, um, you know, the parafunctional activities. I mean, there's. We can, let's be more specific as to which ones and we could decide. Well, there was another question about movement. Um, uh, and then there was one about maybe um, just like thumb sucking or, or. Okay. Thumb sucking. That's a great one. Because okay. what is, what does sucking the thumb do? Well, it can actually help clear the airway. All right. It helps keep the jaw forward, but at the same time, it's disturb. It's distorting the dentition and it's, and it's changing the, the shape of the mouth. So I think um, thumb sucking persists um, in children that are two, three years old, four years old. And if they're primarily doing it in their sleep, the, that should be a red flag um, because you know, what there's something stimulating that behavior and it may be a comforting aspect because the child will actually sleep better. 
Yeah, and with the thumb sucking or any digit habit or clothing or objects like pens, a lot of that is also servicing the hyperactivity of the extraoral musculatures, which is the compensation for the weak intraoral muscle activity. And so when the, when the tongue is weak and dysfunctional, the child recruits the extraoral muscles to finish or complete a swallow. So part of the, part of the compensatory mechanism for that weak and dysfunctional intraoral uh, process, which is through the tongue, is that we recruit the extraoral. Now, as the extraoral muscles gain in function and strength, then they have to be serviced because what happens then is that musculature is being used more often during the swallowing when it's not normally. And all of a sudden it's looking to be active. And so the, the child naturally starts to put things through their mouth. I think that a lot of the myofunctional therapy community recognizes that uh, thumb, digit, clothing, objects uh, has to do with you know the need to keep servicing musculature that is hyperactive and growing in strength. But meanwhile, we're only using it you know, as a, a dysfunctional or a malfunctioning type of a mechanism where we're recruiting the face to swallow because the tongue that is weak and dysfunctional doesn't really get to complete a perfect vacuum swallow. So part of it is that it's, it's almost the same as like that ADHD, you wake up and you, you know, you, you should be tired all day, but there's that level of hyperactivity where the child's being pushed to stay more awake. They're getting ingredients that are driving them. So they can't sit still. They're running around to burn off that excess energy. Part of that relates to the thumb sucking habits as well. Do you have any suggestions on how to find other physicians in the area with an emphasis on sleep medicine, especially for younger children? Can you repeat that? Yes, any suggestions on how to find other physicians in the area with an emphasis on sleep medicine, especially for younger children? Oh, how to find? Well, I guess, you know, one with the internet. So, yeah. Sounds like Dr. Simmons. It sounds like someone's asking you to build a network. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> you, know, you, you need to recruit and build a network. Yeah. Well, I wish there were more hours in the day. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I know the feeling. It, yeah. it, it, there, it, um, I mean, there are more, more um, clinicians that are getting interested in this area. So you know, just search out on the internet. And I think the main thing is to not want to work in a silo. You, you want to really reach out and, and, and collaborate. And you could also, um, as I pointed out, with telemedicine, you can you know, look out geographically for distances. And if you could also invite your physicians to Dr. Simmons' meeting in February, that might help out. And that's anybody happened who could before. attend that. That that's would help. Actually, that's happened where, we, uh, where there have been dentists that have brought their physician colleagues along with them. Um, and uh, there actually will also be CME credits for physicians for this conference, uh, but it's not the entire conference. It's uh, basically um, half of the conference. The, the, the Friday uh, on February um, 4th and half of the 5th uh, will all qualify for CME through the Texas Medical Association we've partnered up with for it. So it's 24 hours of CE credits for the dentists and 12 hours of CME for physicians. Mm -hmm. And also the AAPMD. That's another, another AAPMD is uh, another way of getting more information and working to collaborate. I mean, I mean AAPMD is really looking to get more physician participation in there. So that would be um, uh, a clear way of gaining more but you know the APMD has so many different topics it's not all just on sleep uh, so it would be a, a different um, uh, pathway but that's, you know I think it's good to have physician participation at the APMD. How do the criteria for a sleep apnea in children differ from adults? Well the uh, the frequency of the respiratory events is different so Basically, for a child, if they have an apnea hypopnea index of greater than once an hour, it's considered to be abnormal. Um, it gets to be a little bit of a gray zone on some of that, but clearly, uh, you know, an index of four per hour, for example, would be considered normal for an adult, but for a child, that would clearly be abnormal. And uh, you know anything over 15 in a child is going to be considered to be severe. 
So the, um, the frequency of the respiratory events uh, for our threshold of, of establishing a diagnosis and intervening is much lower in children. And do children with UARS get missed on sleep studies like adults do? Oh, for sure. Yeah. Um, so, what is UARS? That you know that that's a whole other topic in and of itself. People throw that term around, um, and what they really have to understand is that our definition of sleep apnea has changed over time. So prior to 2012, uh, the scoring criteria for hypopneas uh, changed from, uh, they it would, would require a 4% oxygen desaturation. Then in 2012, there was a change. There was a lot of pol uh, politics, a lot of uh, back and forth. And then finally, by 2013, they came out with a new set of scoring rules uh, for hypopneas, rule 1A and rule 1B. And rule uh, 1A doesn't require any desaturation. It requires just a reduction of flow or some high method of measuring hypopneas to be occurring for 10 seconds or longer leading to an arousal and you don't have to have any desaturation. So doing the nasoesophageal pressure monitoring would actually qualify. We do that in our labs. We're one of the only places, only a handful of places in the country that will measure the, the intrathoracic pressures, uh, the pleural pressures associated with breathing and we could pick up events that would be missed by other parameters. Flow limitation is useful, but it can still miss um, uh, these effort-related arousals. But the point being is that uh, the hypopneas do not require desaturation. That's rule 1A. Rule 1B is the old, same as the old rule that you need to have a 4% oxygen desaturation. So the American Academy of Sleep Medicine allows both rules, to be, either rule to be used. A sleep lab can be fully accredited even if they only use rule 1B, meaning they may totally not score these effort-related arousals and they can still be a fully accredited lab. So someone needs to understand what their lab does, okay? But the reason I bring this up under the discussion of upper airway resistance syndrome is because there are patients in the past that used to be labeled as upper airway resistance syndrome, but now we can call them obstructive sleep apnea because these events that we weren't supposed to be tabulating as hypopneas before that were being called um, respiratory effort-related arousals, now they qualify as hypopneas. So the rules that everyone reverts to to look at what is a RERA, respiratory effort-related arousals, those have never been updated, All right? So what is a RERA? What is a respiratory effort-related arousal? So if someone tells me, oh, that's when you're going to have some kind of flow limitation for 10 seconds, and then it leads to an arousal, that's a RERA. And I'm going to come right back and say, what if it's only nine seconds? What if it's only eight seconds? What's so special about 10 seconds in order to be tabulated in, in before it leads to an arousal. So you could really, from a clinical standpoint, in someone that lives in this space and deals with patients all day long, you could say that if you have any kind of airway compromise that leads to an arousal, even if it's less than 10 seconds, it's worthy of being tabulated in someone that's symptomatic. So I use that last point, that if someone's symptomatic, why did I say that? because by definition, upper airway resistance syndrome patients have to have symptoms. You could take two people with the exact same polysomnogram with the same number of related arousals. One could be totally symptomatic and daytime sleepiness and the other person is fine because their brain can withstand the ill effects of fragmented sleep. The one that feels fine does not have upper airway resistance even though their polysomnogram is the same as someone is, who is very symptomatic. So we don't want to treat the tests. We want to treat the patients. And upper airway resistance syndrome patients have to have symptoms. So let's go back to the question about kids. So if you're going to say, are kids going to be missed for having upper airway resistance syndrome? Well, it, you want to say, you know, is, does a child have symptoms? So if you're going to look at, you look at a child's airway and you're going to see they've got a high arch palate They've got, you know, a micrognathia and then you're saying this is a compromised airway, but the child may be totally fine, have no symptoms whatsoever. 
or not that's the the norm would be the child would have symptoms but they're on the outlier they're on the edge of the spectrum where they're not having symptoms and that's because the brain is more resilient to the ill effects of the fragmented sleep you could do a, so if you do a sleep study and all you see are these effort related arousals do you then go in there and label the child as having a pro resistance syndrome so those are the I, I just went off there for over five yeah, minutes. It's, it's, okay. Yeah, it's okay. But there's a lot to that question and how we answer that. When is a sleep study required in children? What do you mean? Is it like required, like as though in order to. Uh, what what, 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 what is, is the guidelines? What, what is, you mean, when is it justified? When is it required? That, that was the terminology. Well, when, when is there an indication? Because, yes. okay. you know, so, um, when would it be medically indicated to do a sleep study? So it would be when there's so, some clinical suspicion of abnormal function. And it could be that the child is fine during the day. But at night, the parent hears the abnormal breathing and the child's thrashing around in their sleep. All right. Or, you know, and then there's bedwetting, it's persisting. You know, the child's now you know, 12 years old, I'm still bedwetting. Um, the, yeah, they need a sleep study. A child's doing unusual behaviors in their sleep. They need a sleep study. Not all uh, sleep conditions are breathing. There could be, uh, you know, other REM behavior disorder. I mean, there's narcolepsy in little kids, there's restless leg syndrome, there are, you know, abnormal, you know, parasomnias, there's night terrors. There's a lot of things that go on, but so if there's something abnormal, now, if all you do is you see the child has abnormal uh, structures of their airway, you want to hunt for symptoms. And if you don't find any, then do you really, what do you do? Well, that's really a difficult question. We're trying to answer that because my guess is that that child is going to have a higher likelihood of developing sleep apnea as an adult. So should we intervene at this level when there's no symptoms? I think we just lay it out to the parent and describe what it is and say, you know, we have a clinically think the child's going to have a higher likelihood of developing sleep apnea, but right now we can't find symptoms. But then the patient, the, the parent needs to be educated what to look for because they may very well come back and say, you know, I've been looking, I noticed that my child actually, yeah, drools on their pillow every night and tosses and turns. And I hear these pauses in their breathing, you know, do a sleep study. All right. And, you know, you could do a sleep study at the, if it's not as difficult to get one done at that earlier stage, you know, because you see an abnormal airway. Now, it sure could be easy to just slip on some kind of wearable and, and obviously it's back abnormal and the child's asymptomatic. Well, then you've got a clinical feature worthy of treating. So, you know, it's... Um, but what you really don't want to miss are the symptomatic children that are, are struggling, that are being put on medications to treat their behaviors when it really is an airway problem. I mean, to me, that is, that's the major uh, uh, low-lying fruit, big uh, gap in our current health care system. And maybe you both could answer this. How would you respond to the mother of a four-year-old who says her child's bruxism is because he's under too much stress at a preschool? I can start, or you can start, whatever you like. I'd say, okay, what happened? What, what's going on during summer vacation? You know, what happens when the child's not stressed? You know, and is the child bruxing during the day too? Um, bruxing will be worse under stress, and there's a lot of different reasons why that may be. And we also know that sleep deprivation can enhance bruxism, and I, I, we don't have time to go into why that may be. Um, but I would tell the parent that um, it still would be worthwhile to look at other factors as well. And that bruxism is destroying their anatomy, their teeth, their jaw. And it may not just be the stress. Um, and so let's consider other things uh, rather than just assuming it's the stress. Yeah, right. Anytime I hear or see uh, bruxism, it, it really doesn't matter the age of the patient. I relate it right away or look for the, uh, the airway compromise. And so uh, the airway compromise comes from the anatomical underdevelopment. And so the moment you start to take your records and discover that you do not have a fully grown 
or fully growing set of jaws, the maxilla and mandible are underdeveloped, whether it's, you know, they're not wide enough, they're not forward enough, uh, either direction or both usually, then you intervene because uh, it's not, I don't have the experience of treating a child who bruxes their teeth uh, with jaw development and they continue to brux their teeth. So when you recognize that you've stopped the bruxism, what you've done is you've shut off the sympathetic nervous system. And so clenching and grinding the teeth is connected to fight or flight. It's in the sympathetic category. And when you have an airway compromise, you activate the sympathetic nervous system for protection. And sure enough, you're, one of the things you're going to be doing is clenching and grinding their teeth. Um, we don't meet many four-year-olds that have a level of stress in their life where they would clench and grind their teeth. Uh, and so that, for me, I don't blame it on stress in the lifestyle as much as I do uh, stress in the breathing category. And so poor breathing isn't just while you're sleeping. If your anatomy is underdeveloped, you're not breathing well during the day. And so if you're not breathing well during the day, you probably have episodes of sympathetic drive to protect it. And so anyone who is out of the category of nasal breathing that is silent and invisible is open to sympathetic drive as a compensatory mechanism. And next thing you know, you're going to have some bruxism and it's going to show. So the pathway for bruxism for me is, uh, is diagnostics in the anatomy and then grow those kids because we don't meet many children that are fully growing and developing, you know, on their own. That's unheard of. And thanks to Dr. Boyd and all his work with, you know, the likes of Dr. Corcini and the early soft diet, you know, the early soft diet is completely ubiquitous across our nation. And so when you're thinking about kids who are seventh generation post-industrial living, they have underdeveloped jaws thanks to the disuse in the musculature early, which means underdeveloped jaws deliver an airway compromise, which means you're going to have sympathetic drive or activation day or night, and you could have day or night bruxism. And so the idea there is you see or hear any type of bruxing as a symptom from a family member, whether it's the parent or even the school, whoever you might learn it from, then it's automatically, okay, here come the diagnostics. And the diagnostics would include, of course, the full dental records, followed by maybe the nasal scope at the ENT, then a sleep study like Dr. Simmons is recommending. You have all of these things that can be put together to figure out, okay, where do we go from here? And at the top of the list is jaw growth and development. Because when you have fully grown jaws, you don't have this list of symptoms. And treating the, the underdevelopment tends to relieve almost all of these symptoms in short order. So I'm a big fan of jaw growth and development being at the top of the list in a full collaborative care mechanism. So you can really attack every single box because even a little bit of mouth breathing is wildly unhealthy. And so in my world, bruxing is an airway issue. And when we treat that underdeveloped anatomy, we tend to see the bruxing go away or stop. Um, Dr. Simmons, do you use an airway CBCT in your diagnosis? And is there a minimal measurement at rest that is a red flag for you? So I do not. Um, I leave that to the dentists who all have invested in their CBCTs. And so I don't want them to feel that I'm stealing some of their thunder. Um, but also the other reason why I don't is because um, the treatments that I'm um, providing aren't changing the anatomy per se. So in other words, I collaborate. I'm not doing the dentistry. I'm not doing the oral surgery. I'm not doing the ENT procedure. I'm collaborating with other physicians that will provide that component. So I let them do the imaging. And then what do you do about bite changes after treating with sleep devices? Maybe Dr. Morale, you want to touch on that since you're... <laughs> one, one more time on that one. What do you do about bite changes after treating with sleep devices? Bite changes after well, I treating think it's, sleep yeah, devices. Some of the side effects. Advancement, that, probably. Yeah, so let me, yeah. let me give you my non-dental thing and then I'll let Go you ahead. take it from there. Those can be minimized by proper management of the patient and using a morning positioner and having a good you know, uh, positioning that with a little repositioning appliance that you make for the patient and they need to use it every morning for about 10, 15 minutes. And when they don't, there's much higher likelihood of having complications. But clearly you are putting stresses and strains on the mouth and so there are going to be changes. And I tell my patients that it will change your butt most likely in most cases. Um, but that's also why I tell them that you can't just advance this as far as you go 
and that it's just you know that, that um that we're trying to uh, bringing the draft forward to some degree is good bring it too far may have its you know, detrimental consequences but i'll let you take it from there ben yeah so um i I don't use mandibular advancement devices as part of my routine. I usually default to uh, growth and development appliances for the jaw. I'm looking to develop the maxilla as big as possible. And so uh, I do get patients in who are referred to me after the mandibular advancement treatment in a different practice or hands might develop that edge to edge or class three-ish bite from that treatment. And then I've got to go in and, and do maxillary development. And so uh, it's, it's possible to get back into maxillary development pretty much at any age. And then you can grow that maxilla bigger and try to correct that bite. It's not easy or the most fun thing to do, but it's possible. I would be, you know, the, the viewpoint I have is for the general dentist to be aware that the possibility is that the maxilla is rotating backwards, not just that the mandible might be coming forward. You know, the maxillary sutures can be remodeled uh, well into the sixth decade. So I want to be careful with the mandibular advancement device. If you're using it with your physician and it's being titrated perfectly, like Dr. Simmons was saying, you could have a light, gentle force that provides the airflow that's appropriate, but doesn't necessarily produce a change in the bite. I think if you find that change in the bite, then you should you know, probably look at that again and make sure you're using the least amount of positioning change, the least amount of force to, to have a positive impact on the breathing but not so much have a, a, a big change in that bite. We're not looking to land in Dr. Markland's study. And so Markland published in 2016 that you know, long-term use of the mandibular advancement device for some patients was producing you know, that change in the bite and it was significant. But what he learned was that over time, the longer they were used, you were getting an OSA diagnosis worse than the original diagnosis with the appliance in place. And I think that might've been excessive force for too long and then not recognizing or um, you know not paying too much attention to the fact that the maxillary sutures can remodel we just don't want to turn the mandibular advancement device into a headgear effect because pulling the lower forward is equal to pulling the upper backward so we have a balance of the force going there you know just because we're pulling the lower forward doesn't mean you don't have the equal and opposite you have the same amount of force on the upper backwards and over a long period of time if you start remodeling that maxilla back it kind of fits Markland's study that you could have someone have OSA worse, even if you're trying to hold the tongue forward, because now your compromise is coming more from the upper airway now, and you've got this problem in the bite, but it, it, was, it could be a, a sign to be careful with how far that's going, as far as what kind of force is being used, and maybe we should try a different technique. Okay. Uh, any comment on that, Dr. Simmons? Just that if they... Collaborate with me and I do nightly monitoring. I'll start telling you if you're creating problems. Yeah, you have it right. I think there those supplies in some team. people's hands are loosely <laughs> used. And yeah, you're doing a nice job with it. Some doctors are not because I see some of those horrific bites come to me and I have to fix it. I'm like, well, that's a lot of force people were using in but, there. Well, and if but if someone is making someone's apnea worse, you know, by nightly, you know, what's the value of a single night study versus having nightly monitoring? Oh yeah, tracking over time is the best because if you're using that appliance and things are getting worse, then time to change directions. Right. Okay, and then last question, does any airway treatment tie into TMD treatment? Oh my gosh, of course, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, you know, it's funny because um, I remember years ago uh, when I was out there promoting about bruxing um, and uh, TMD, how it to airway and by treating the airway you can actually resolve tmd symptoms and there's what's it called dental town uh mm -hmm. and i started getting phone calls from people saying wow they're talking about you on dental town you need to get on there and defend yourself <laughs> and um, i'm like what do you mean i could there's some people that are saying that you're you know totally wacko and off base and um and i'm sitting there i believe in i've heard you talk i heard whatever and what you should get on the show i can't got a user account and signed into dental town <laughs> and i couldn't believe just some of the things that you know and so i spent time giving you know um, my rebuttal to their statements and um it's funny because now years later i'm seeing some of those names of these individuals that were arguing with me as now claiming to be oral uh, airway dentists 
and their TM, their, their you know, TMD oral um, airway uh, uh, sleep dentists. So they've, you know, they, because I think most people that do TMD have now have come to realize that if you don't, this is what Dr. Preen really is well known for, because he's one of the first ones leading the pack with me. Um, and, and he actually gave me more and more challenging cases uh, with more and more subtle degrees of obstruction that were really still linked to um, uh, you know, the airway causing the TMD. And um, so, uh, you know, but nowadays, I don't think you could really do TMD uh, management without also understanding and managing airway. Dr. Mara, you want to touch on that as well? Oh, yeah. So we treat all the TMD patients with maxillary growth and development, and it solves every symptom. And it's a, I've got a nine-year streak running now with TMD resolution of every symptom to full resolution and not having a repeated symptom as the years go by. Some of those patients are now seven and eight years out of treatment. Um, I have treated the patient with the most mild, simplest TMD all the way to the bedridden vertigo related loss of quality of life, lost your job, lost your home, the disaster in the TMD category, all the way to full resolution. And it comes from maxillary growth and development. And it doesn't matter what age it is. Um, I find that a lot of the uh, children and teens and adults that we get into the TMD category have had a significant history of retractive orthodontic technique. And so that, again, isn't research because it's in my own practice, but we're talking about hundreds of people a year that I get to look and see this in. And then the reality is when we go the opposite direction for wider and forward, again, if you're doing jaw development and you, you treat the maxillary jaw as the criminal, then you get a chance to give the mandible a chance to land where it belongs. So in my world, if the maxilla is underdeveloped, it doesn't matter where your mandible lands, it's in the wrong place. An underdeveloped maxilla basically by definition, we'll have a mandible landing into it in the wrong position. There's no such thing as the mandible is accurately positioned when your maxilla is underdeveloped. It's just, that's where it connects right now. As soon as you develop the upper jaw, then your mandible has a chance to go where it belongs. So if you treat the maxilla, which is the criminal, the mandible happens to be the victim, you would find a different approach to TMD. And I don't have a single patient in a night guard or a splint anymore. So I don't use night guards or splints uh, for TMD treatment. That is, you know, more of a band-aid, I would call those. The idea behind TMD symptoms, they're on a list of symptoms that patients have. Um, it's rare that people have one symptom only, but when you have a long list of symptoms, and again, you're taking a look at that underdeveloped human being, maxillary growth and development is the answer for, for TMD in my world. And we're nine years running now where we treat the TMD patient, regardless of the level of symptomatology, regardless of the history, it doesn't matter how many decades, it could be three, four, five decades of TMD issue. And you could have people who are having headaches daily, weekly. It makes no difference when we're done with them. Well, not when we're done. Within weeks, those symptoms start to fade. And within months, they're all gone. And then as the years go by, you know, they're almost a little bit surprised that I haven't had a headache in four years. I haven't had a headache in five years. Um, I've been chewing my food with, it, with comfort for however many years over time. So yeah, for me, I approach TMD differently than I used to. I used to make a lot of night guards. I used to make splints. I used to send people to get splints. Um, now it's different. We look at the level of jaw growth and development, and we make them appliances to grow that maxilla. We treat the foundation first. As you grow the foundation, it does improve your sleeping and breathing. Again, the whole list of things that can improve your airway are tied to this. So anytime we're doing jaw and or you know, facial growth and development, it includes improving the airway. And then of course, the techniques with the Frenum revisions, the myofunctional therapy and nasal scope, maybe there's a septum issue. All these things you know, are on the list. It's not just growth and development appliances. When you get the foundation produced appropriately, then you've got to coordinate the teeth. So it's foundation first, teeth second, coordinate the teeth, let them come together. Now you've got your jaws where they belong and your TMD symptoms go away, same as the bruxism goes away, same as the, you name it, the headaches. It doesn't matter what the symptom is, it all fades away. Just to wrap up this question, what comes first, OSA or TMD? Is it that simple? <laughs> Mm. Um, let, let, let's, rephrase, let's rephrase it because um, it, obviously every patient's different, but it airway compromise comes first, but it may not manifest as OSA because of the bruxing that's going on to prevent the patient from reaching a certain threshold of, of obstructive. So there's a propensity towards obstruction, but the bruxing may minimize it. 
Yeah, OSA is so far down the line, it's an end result and it's a chronic deterioration. When the, by the time you've gotten to OSA, you know, you're in a world of trouble and you've had decades of inflammatory response damaging your arteries and it should be no surprise that you're gonna end up with a heart attack or a stroke with untreated OSA, but who needs to have an OSA diagnosis you know, right. to, to, to prove or you need treatment or something. The idea is, why are we waiting to get to OSA? In other words, OSA, you didn't just have it where you didn't yesterday. So OSA is not an acute injury and it begins somewhere. And if you trace OSA all the way back to where it starts, it starts with underdeveloped anatomy and underdeveloped anatomy is gonna produce an OSA result somewhere. Whether you're a child, a teen, an adult, at some point in your life, you're probably get an OSA diagnosis if you're, if you're left untreated with undeveloped anatomy. But it doesn't matter to actually wait for or have an OSA diagnosis because long before that, you would have something like mouth breathing or snoring or anything that is not nasal breathing that is silent and invisible is gonna be a form of an airway compromise that'll trigger symptoms somewhere. So TMD, OSA, these are all symptoms. Not everybody gets those symptoms. Some people have other symptoms, but they're, they're all symptoms that should be treated. And then you figure out, okay, what's the best way to treat those? You have a lot at your disposal. Right. And we really didn't touch much on myofunctional therapy and how it has its beneficial influences in tongue posture, but uh, yeah. things of that nature. And yeah, wow. Whole it's, other category uh, to help a patient. Yeah. In, yeah. yeah, but we always do. And I just want to be mindful of everyone's time. I'm just going to go ahead and give some updates because we have really exciting things coming up at Airway Health Solutions. Who's that handsome guy there? I know Dr. Boyd's watching right now. So we're really excited uh, that we have two new courses with Dr. Boyd um, coming up next Friday is the Pediatric Validated Airway Risk Assessment. Um, you'll learn a lot about screening. So again, we can only do limited, li limited amount of information in these short conversations conversations, but hopefully it gets your interest to learn more. And then he's going to also have a course January 14th on enjoy treating kids in your dental practice. Yes, you can. So look into that, please, um, on our website. Uh, we have our mini residencies with Dr. Ben Moralia, um, which he goes over um, interceptive, myofunctional, and expansion um, in children. And then in adults, yes, you can expand adults. There was a question on our chat there. Um, there's plenty of research to support that. And, and Dr. Moralia teaches how in this, in this mini residency. So we have dates coming up in January, March, and then also in May. Um, we do have a myofunctional therapy course that we are really proud of, and it's geared towards the hygienist to do myofunctional therapy in the dental practice, because we didn't have a lot of time to touch on myo today, but it's integral to any type of expansion therapy and also interceptive orthodontics. So check out our website and to learn more about that. And then save the dates. Um, April 1st, we're gonna have our Airway Health Solutions Advanced Mini Residency with Dr. Kevin Boyd. It's gonna be somewhere warm in Florida. Uh, we're really excited about that. More details to come, but that'll be a full day mini residency. And it's an advanced course that we really highly, highly, highly recommend you take Dr. Moralia's mini residency first. Um, July 6th through the 9th, there's a dental festival in Nashville. It's a great team builder. We were there last year in Florida. On um, July 8th, we're doing our Airway Health Solutions Conference. And July 9th, our Clear Line University Conference. Again, um, Dr. Moralia, Dr. Boyd, uh, myself, Paris Laguerre, and um, Brittany Sierra will be there to, to teach you and your team. And then December 3rd and 5th of 2022, Next year, we're really th we're throwing our first Airway Palooza, and it's going to be um, a two-day conference with uh, various Airway experts. So save the date if you're planning on your 2022 calendar, um, which is coming up soon. And then in June, we have our advanced mini residency with Dr. Ben on until uh, June 3rd and 10th. That's 100% virtual. We highly recommend you take our pediatric mini residency first. We are looking for more green dots. So after you take our course, we do put you on our locator. I get asked probably daily by patients where they can find an airway dentist near them. So once you take the course, you get the benefit of that. And also being on our Facebook group where we collaborate and have some private um, study clubs like we're having next week uh, with Dr. Brett Christensen. I see he's on tonight as well. Um, he's going to go over using the echo vision, the rhinometer, and pharyngometry with our exclusive alumni. So that'll be um, a great intimate study club. 
June 5th, we're having a conversation just with Dr. Ben Raya and co-hosted with Dr. Hal Stewart on airway dentistry for those who want to learn more about expansion um, and interceptive orthodontics. And then February 28th, we have Dr. Nelly Silva on airway and heart health since February is um, heart mm -hmm. month. So here's the contact information. I know we had um, a lot, a lot of information today, but please make sure that you really look into the sleep conference that Dr. Um, Simmons is putting together. You will learn so much. You'll collaborate and you'll walk away from that with a wealth of information. So I highly, highly recommend um, that you attend. Um, any last words, Dr. Simmons, you want to say about the, the conference that we may not have mentioned? No, just that I'm excited about it. It's, you know, this now with the, the whole COVID uh, pandemic issues and people being locked up. Last year, we didn't hold the conference. It's the first time in, in many, many, many years that the first time I think ever that we weren't able to, to do it. And uh, it, there's also, there's a hands-on component to the conference where we learn on doing the exams. It's going to be interesting, you know, how we'll handle that part with um, with the, the pandemic and the face shields or whatever. We'll, we'll figure that one out. But, um, you know, we want, there's, you also will be working with appliances too on the hands-on, learning how to uh, 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 deal with adjusting and things of that nature. Um, so there's, you know, um, anyhow, I, I'm excited to be uh, collaborating with uh, professionals from different types of uh, specialties, and we all bring our our knowledge together to help our patients, and it's it's, it's great. So. Well, thank you for all you do. We really appreciate your time tonight. We learned so much. Um, everyone's thanking us in the chat. Dr. Morali, thank you. Um, also, it was nice to have you both collaborate together, and we'll have to do this again. Sounds great. Thank you. All right. Well, happy yeah, thank you, everyone. Happy Hanukkah. Um, and uh, we'll see our alumni next week, but everyone else will see next year. And we have really exciting things happening in 2022. So can't yeah. wait. Take Good night, care. everybody. Bye. Good night, everybody.